Starship's seventh booster hightails it back to the high bay yet again. SpaceX gives their competition a lift. Star Shield is now a thing, but you can't have none. And we finished with today's honorable mention. I'm Kevin, and this is SpaceX in the News. After last week's 11 engine static fire, Booster 7 received its new Raptor replacements, only to be taken off the orbital launch mount over the weekend and transported back to High Bay 2 for the fifth or sixth time. I don't know, I lost count. What for exactly has not been disclosed by Musk or SpaceX at this time, but if you have not scrubbed your expectations for a December launch to orbit, that moment has long since passed. So in Booster 7's absence, the OLM has continued to receive upgrades to plumbing and shielding, something that happens after every static fire as the company progresses toward a full 33 engine burn. And employees were also seen tearing up concrete around the pad. Now you may be thinking, couldn't they mitigate some of this damage with the trench? Well, of course they could, but when SpaceX purchased the property about eight years ago, they had to make some significant reinforcements to the marshy foundation since it's so close to the shoreline. So while it's certainly possible, digging just isn't very practical and it's also expensive. Plus, Elon wrote a couple years back that they were aspiring to get away with not using one. Probably because they won't have the option on the oil rigs they'll eventually use to launch and catch these rockets. A flame bucket commonly used at test sites could still be useful, but the company must not see it that way. Reinforcing, repainting, and removing loose concrete after each test appears to be their preferred strategy. Anyway, the scaffolding surrounding the booster's better half, Starship 24, has begun to come down, although workers continue to poke away at the bottom, and her successor, S25, rests up the road in the high bay where its Starlink Pezdor, like its predecessor, has been welded shut. Booster 9 could roll down to the launch site at any moment to begin her stress testing regimen as well, and Elon has confirmed that although his main focus is Twitter at the moment, he still continues to oversee SpaceX operations, but teams are so good that often little is needed from him. On Thursday, MZ finally revealed his lineup of fellow crew members on Starship's first crew trip around the moon for his Dear Moon project. First announced in September of 2018, their mission will be, well, I'm not really sure what their mission is, inspire the world, I guess, while making a week-long journey to the moon and back documenting their experience. Tim Dodd was one of the 10 selected, including two backups. Congrats, Timmy. Frankly, I gotta say I'm shocked my video submission making fun of the entire thing didn't win. But to those of you who may be saddened you also weren't selected, just think of being trapped in a steel container full of artists where no one can hear you scream. Way to dodge that bullet. The fuck is that shit? Also yesterday, SpaceX launched 40 Constellation satellites for their Starlink competitor, OneWeb. They booked with SpaceX after the Russia-Ukraine war kicked off and hitching a ride on Soyuz was no longer an option. This was the fourth mission for this boomstick. Check out the light show created by the evening sun rays highlighting the Merlin engine exhaust and the cold gas ACS. Oh, um, she landed back at LZ-1 without a scratch. Just a little sooty. Page one landing burn. Really incredible views from the first stage. Page one landing lake deploy. And the 40 payloads were all deployed successfully over a half hour time span starting an hour after liftoff. SpaceX's next launch is Hakuto R Mission 1 for iSpace, Japan's first private sector led attempt at a lunar landing, currently slated for no earlier than early Sunday morning. Starlink for government is now a thing, dubbed StarShield, leveraging Starlink technology and launch capability to support national security efforts according to SpaceX's Starlink website, for which there is now a dedicated page for StarShield. Using Starlink's unparalleled end-to-end -end user data encryption, in addition to high-assurance cryptography capability to host classified payloads and process data securely, SpaceX's ongoing work with the Pentagon and other partners demonstrates our ability to provide in-space and on-ground capability at scale. Don't be scarred, be secured. <laughs> on Thursday, the company tweeted that Starlink service has officially begun providing low-latency internet to passengers during flights on JSX, and that further installations of the hardware onto additional JSX jets are coming in the weeks ahead. As soon as you walk on the flight, the internet works. 
SpaceX has also filed a request with the FCC to place additional direct-to-sell system equipment, including phased array beam forming and digital processors on 2016 of their recently approved 7500 Gen 2 satellites so their partnership with T-Mobile can kick off. This will enable T-Mobile messaging, voice, and internet for their users at, quote, theoretical peak speeds up to either 2 megabits per second or 7.2 Mbps peak upload. Important to note, this is total bandwidth within a cell, so it would be divided among all phones. Starlink will be great so long as only a dozen phones are active in a region. But the really mind-blowing thing is that this means your phone will work anywhere on Earth unless blocked by local government. T-Mobile also submitted their own filing with the FCC in support of SpaceX's request. SpaceX tweeted about a recent 100-hour gaming session that nerds streamed from a pretty dope castle in Spain using their Starlink service, and retweeted those nerd sickles at the Center for Oldest Ice Exploration using Starlink's unprecedented connectivity in Antarctica. Now I was once hyperthermic for many days in a row, so cold doesn't really tend to bother me. I'm one of those weirdos you'll see wearing flip-flops in the winter, but uh, yeah, screw that noise. Props to you guys for showing up here to stay up to date on SpaceX current events. But do you know who covers not just science, but money, power, war, crime, the list goes on? My friends over at Epic TV. With Epic TV, you can tune into new programs every day from Crossroads to The Larry Elder Show, Facts Matter, and American Thought Leaders. Get reporting on factual events you won't find in major news outlets. Not to mention the award-winning documentaries they have to offer. Their reporters bring you first-hand interviews and on-the-ground footage of the most critical matters in society affecting our liberties, health, and safety. And you can stream Epic TV shows and documentaries on your phone, computer, tablet, or Roku TV. If you're looking for an honest and accurate news source, check them out today. And I have a special offer for you, my viewers. Just sign up and start watching. No credit card required, no strings attached. Then, if you decide to subscribe within 14 days, it's just $1 for two months. Boom! So go to watchepic.com slash space eccentric and subscribe. That's watchepoch.com slash spacex centric. And now it's time for today's honorable mention. NASA's greenest Mars rover, Perseverance, has collected 15 rock samples during its almost two year stay on the red planet. But over the past few days, she cached her first regolith samples, or loose Martian sand the first on December 2nd, and the second on December 6th. These samples could aid in the understanding of the planet's geological history, as well as help the agency plan for future missions on Mars, where dust and dirt present a challenge to astronauts. Now contained in their metal collection tubes, one of these sandy samples will be considered for Earth delivery later this month. NASA just announced they are seeking public comments by December 19th on a draft environmental impact statement for their Mars sample return campaign. The agency, along with ESA, plan to collect some of Percy's samples via a Mars orbiter and lander launching in 2027 and 2028 respectively. They'll be using a mini rocket on the lander to launch the samples back to orbit, intercepting with the orbiter, and then delivering them to Earth early next decade. Well, that's all for this one. Thank you so much for checking in. Much love to my supporters who keep these episodes pumping week to week, but I demand everyone have a nominal weekend. And until next Friday, Godspeed.